from STP43 fan. Question, isn't it time for sanctioning bodies to impose team spending caps? Doesn't necessarily, I think, deal as much with, with the open wheel and with, uh, I guess, the, the Penske organization and Ganassi organization. I guess testing is kind of the key in getting the chassis developed, but with the Honda engines and the packages we have now, perhaps talk a little bit about the future of, of open wheel racing. I, I think, you know, both the, both sanctioning bodies have, have done that to a point. Yeah. You know, that's what the car tomorrow is. That's what the car, the formula that we run in IRL is a, is a thing, is something along that line to help curb the cost of development and, and those types of things and, uh, you know, make it a little more level playing field because um, you can only do X amount. So I think that is already being done and it's something you can't do overnight. You know, they've got to chip away at it a little here, a little there, and, and that's one of the tough things to do in this sport, contain costs. So, you know, I think that's being worked on as we speak, and, and it's going to continue to be worked on as we go down the road. And then to add to that, you know, you look at salary caps that exist, um, I don't think that they work really well or really all that enforced <laughs> in some, some cases. So, yeah. you know, they, they, I don't think that anyone is doing it really right but I think it on all fronts for motorsports and other other forms of sports recognize that we need to keep an even playing field and and it's just a tough business model to get get balanced out and you talk about that fine balance when NASCAR did go to the car of tomorrow fans some enjoyed it some didn't like the racing and and it really took a little while for I think even new drivers to get adapted to those new cars so there was that transition period and it's tough and in a competitive world of, of motorsports you've got to be on your a-game at all times yeah it, it was a tough transition for a lot of people and I know that the drivers were there um, you know griping about the car and, and different aspects on that front but the people that were really taking the, the blunt of it or the car owners um, and everybody thinks you know the, the big teams can easily work through this stuff but we had to take 50 race cars out of for our four race teams and they're, they're obsolete I mean ARC can't use them nationwide can't use them they're gone I mean you, they're just they're gone the parts pieces components that went with it and now we've got to build these new cars and jigs and fixtures and all that stuff uh, for us I was told it's around 20 million dollars to change our inventory over so yes we have a more a better regulated car today, but everyone that was in the sport had to get rid of all of their inventory and start over. So it didn't help the people in the sport per se from a financial standpoint, but it's allowing new people to come in. So it depends on what hat you're wearing. I mean, it is so tough to make the right move for every team, every driver, and to be fair. NASCAR has to look at it and say, how do we keep the competition in the sport and how do we keep the stands full? And, and that's really what any sanctioning body has to look at, and also safety. I mean, they, they did make this car safer for all of us, and we're certainly uh, appreciative of that. Although we had some bumps in the roads, in the road on, on a uh, handling side of things, uh, but we've ended up working through those things now. Rick, talk a little bit about the future of open wheel racing in the eyes on IndyCar Series. Talk of multiple chassis manufacturers, multiple engine manufacturers. Right now, it's a spec series with Honda and Delara as, as the chassis supplier. A lot of hurdles to to climb over and get over and where do you see everything years down the road when this happens well I, I think it's I think we're making some good steps in the right direction but it is tough and like Jimmy said it's it depends on which hat you're wearing you know if I've, if I've if I've got an owner's hat on I want it to go one way if I have a driver's hat on I want it to go another way if I have an engineer's hat I want it to go this way if I have the promoter's hat on I want it to go over here so that's what, what Jimmy was saying the hard part is is trying to figure the best overall picture for, you know the big picture best overall package and uh, and it is very difficult uh, you know and I think if you can get the different manufacturers in there to compete against each other it's good um, but you but also the rules and everything are gonna have to be in a way that it still holds down development to keep costs down so it's a hard thing to find uh, you know you, you I, I don't know how to explain it. We were talking about it a little bit earlier, and it's it's a difficult thing to do to to, to put it in a in a framework that they can still compete against each other, but still contain development cost without trying to get the the one you know leg up. Um, that's the hard part, and I think that's that's why this has been a conversation ongoing for some time now because it is difficult to find that balance, uh, you know, the, the nice balance between all of it, and that's what they're working on. But I think. I think you're going to see some good steps made and, and some, you know, there's some momentum going right now and I think it's going to continue on. I think one other thing to add to it that's tough is we look at 
the world changing and how does racing and mm -hmm. motorsports fit into you know a green world and, and an ever-changing world and motorsports needs to be a platform to where we develop technology to make cars on the road safer and more reliable and alternative fuel sources and engines and we need to be the test bed for the streets and that's how racing was built right. and founded and turned into such a, a great um, sport on its own um, and for a while maybe that that had shifted and gone a different direction and now it seems to be coming back and I think it's good so in the end you know we're trying to keep costs down to keep technology down but technology is what we may really need to do to keep the sport strong and around and it, it's there's there's so many conflicting thoughts that it gets quite confusing inside the, the sport from time to time do you think racing could ever be relevant to the auto industry again that they can take the technology they learn on the track and then put them back into street cars or developments as far as safety with open wheel cars? I think, it's, I think it still is. I think it still is. I think it still is and has been. I don't think that's ever gone away. It's used in different ways and in newer ways, whether it's in the telemetry and measuring things and how to measure things and how to read what you measure and how to how to utilize it after you figure it out. You know, I, there's a lot of things like that are, that are still going over today. The crossover between the, you know, the car manufacturers and the racing, I think, is still going on. And, and I think that's, gonna, that's always going to be. Absolutely. Question here from Curling Racer, did Rick Mears ever consider running sports car prototypes like Jimmy does now? Must have been before him, his time, because I did. I thought you did. Exactly. <laughs> I thought you ran about everything there was. Well, you know, talking about the Glen, the, uh, the Glen that, you, that you just ran a six hour, you know, I ran that a couple of years. And, uh, but when I ran it, it was back in uh, the old 935 days, the 935 Porsches. That's when they were the, the hot rod, so to speak. And, and I ran uh, the Glen, I ran uh, Sebring a couple times, I ran Daytona a few times, so I, it, so I enjoyed it. you run the Glen it. with no bus stop? Uh, yeah. God, that's brave. Yeah. Yeah. That's <laughs> a long straightaway <laughs> well, into it. That's a long way to go. Oof. Well, we ran the Indy cars there with no bus stop. That's right, that's right. Yeah. Man. It, it, I was fighting for the lead one time and it was raining at the other end as you go over that rise yeah. without the bus stop. That, that got a little wild. <laughs> Talk about your venture into Formula One. It was good. It was good, you know. It it uh, it was a great opportunity, and uh, you know, I was contacted by Bernie Ecclestone and his team when he had the Brabham team, and uh, you know, I ended up going over to Paul Ricard over in France and did a test for him there, and then we did another test in Riverside, and um, it was a great opportunity. But the main thing was, I got into this business because I love doing it, and it was fun, and that was my whole thing: is how much fun, where am I going to have the most fun? And, uh, and after I ran the car, I mean, there's always this, if I hadn't been able to drive the car, there would always been this little in the back of my head, yeah, are they really different, you know? But I got to go do the test and that got it out of my system. Once I drove the car, I realized it was a race car. And all race cars talk to you. If you listen to what they tell you and do what they tell you they want, that's what you do. That's how you drive them. And when I got in the Formula One car, yeah, it was different. It was lighter weight and more tire on the ground, better braking. Uh, at that time, had articulating skirts, the ground effects, had, had more downforce, so the corner speed was much quicker. But only thing that changes are your numbers, your shutoff points, your pickup throttle points. Uh, it's still about the limit, getting through the limit, whatever that limit is. So once I drove the car and realized it was a race car, and we were, we ran competitive times, and I knew we could be competitive if we wanted to do it, then it and we came to terms on everything contract-wise. It was a matter of do I want to do, which one do I want to do? So I just started weighing the facts. And what boiled down to is, uh, that would make me the happiest was staying where I was at because in our series we got to run road races, short oval, street, street circuits, permanent circuits, you know, high bank. We got to do it all in our series and, and that's what I enjoyed. So I stayed with the IndyCar. Question here, let me get it so I, I get this worded correctly. This is from Mark S. Bree, and this is for Rick. And I'll throw this out to you as well, Jimmy. What's the most, and maybe I won't throw this right at you, Jimmy, because I think we have to preface this. The most unusual image insect you photograph, Rick, is that one of your hobbies, is photography? <laughs> I, yeah, I, I just play around with it. Yeah, I have been for the last four or five years a little bit, but uh, I don't know what the most unusual, I can't even name them. I don't even, I don't even know what I'm shooting half the time. If I see something that, that interests me, I put a camera on it and shoot it. But uh, it's fun, you know, working with the macro lens on the, the, the small insects or just small things in general, whether it be water drops, uh, you know, falling from a faucet or after they hit the water in the rebound. It's, and what you can do with lighting and uh, through the water as far as the water drops go. Uh, it's just fun to tinker with. And um, 
So I don't know what names of the insects, but we've got a couple different ones. Jimmy, what's the odd, I, I guess, I don't know if photography is your hobby, but do you have any odd, hey, Jimmy Johnson does this and nobody knows about it, hobbies that you like to do to kind of get away from everything and relax? Um, well, my world is changing dramatically. We're, we're expecting our first here in a month's time. So thank you. Little girl, correct? Little girl, yeah. yes. Uh, so I, my camera right now has been used taking photos of my wife each month, you know, and the progress of, of her stomach and all of that, which has been a lot of fun to look back on. And then my spare time, honestly, lately has been assembling baby stuff. We just had our baby shower and it's amazing how many boxes, you know, and stuff <laughs> and things, and you don't realize you need all that stuff. So. I put together a few um, or strollers and a crib and tinkering around with that kind of stuff here lately. You're going to have to put an addition on your house for the baby. Trust me, by the I time everything imagine. is done, you just keep adding and adding and adding. Yeah. Here's a question for Jimmy from At First Turn Spin. What other NASCAR drivers would you ever see being able to run in the Indianapolis 500? Of course, Tony Stewart has done it. Juan Pablo Montoya has done it. Uh, John Andretti has, you know, still runs a NASCAR Robbie. and has done it. Uh, Robbie yeah. Gordon. I mean, there are drivers that do it. Talk about the guys that you see running week in and week out that go, you know what, that guy's got a lot of talent too. I think Kyle Busch comes to mind. Uh, other drivers of that and that nature you think could run over here? Yeah, you know, I look at Tony and I look at Juan and, you know, they both have done it and been competitive. So I don't see them in the category I'm in where I want the experience. Uh, they come back, they, they have high expectations to win, and, and I think those would be two land, lead candidates to come back and, and have a shot to win in both races. Um, but when you get outside of that category, I mean, we're all racers. We all love driving stuff. Um, I think A.J. Allmendinger comes to mind, you know, with his, his experience in open wheel. Um, Scott Speed would come to mind. I, I think Casey Mears would love to, to do it. Um, I've talked to Kyle. He would be interested. Um, clearly, I, I would as well. Um, Carl Edwards loves to drive anything with wheels on it. I mean, there, there would be a lot of interest. I think our biggest problem would be quality cars to put guys in and, and finding a way to get enough practice time for everyone.